Hello everyone and welcome to our special discussion with Prime Minister the Honorable Alan Chastney. It's part two of a special production looking back at 2019, the achievements and the challenges. And in this hour, we have the spotlight on health and the tourism sector. The health sector, Mr. Prime Minister, is critical and to your own admission, and again, we go back to your budget address for 2019-2020, you said that dealing with the shortcomings has taken longer than desired. However, to your credit, you have remained resolute in trying to resolve what those issues are. But to the public's mind, the issues of health care are really boxed in into the commissioning or the non-commissioning of the St. Jude's Hospital and the OKEU, the Owen King EU Hospital. Uh, but it is as those perhaps who are very entrenched in what's going on, a more complex matter. So we'll get to expound on what those uh, complications are. But first, we'll review some of the highlights of the sector for 2019. Remaining a concern to both the government and citizens, Health issues were and continue to be tackled by various interventions. The two main hospitals were in sharp focus throughout 2019. To ensure proper health care to citizens in the south, the government embarked on the construction of a new St. Jude Hospital. The 90-bed facility will cater for both inpatient and outpatient services. In the north, the phased transition from the Victoria Hospital to the OKEU continued in 2019 with the physiotherapy, dialysis and outpatient units along with the IT department and sections of the laboratory. Recognizing that the biggest deficiency in the nation's healthcare system is that tens of thousands of St. Lucians are unable to afford health care, the government has pushed forward with the National Health Insurance Program. This program aims to ensure that all St. Lucians have health insurance, with government bearing the cost to cover the vulnerable, elderly and unemployed. The World Bank Health System Strengthening Project is well poised to push the primary health care agenda forward because this project is committed to the implementation of national health insurance while ensuring that our primary health care facilities are equipped to deliver services which will promote preventative care of the population. In 2019, the government also launched the Health System Strengthening Project. The new system is aimed at improving health coverage to St. Lucians. The project is aimed at improving accessibility, efficiency and responsiveness of key health services. And how do we aim to achieve that? For accessibility, the NHI will definitely address that in terms of our benefits package, giving our population access to a specified benefits package. Efficiency will look at how we make our healthcare providers more accountable, how we treat our patients according to protocols. In an effort to reduce morbidity and mortality in terms of the number of persons in St. Lucia being stricken with certain diseases, the Ministry of Health embarked on an island-wide immunization drive to ensure all children at the age of five were assessed and vaccinated. The aim of this initiative was to reduce the need for hospitalization and medication and the cost that comes along with it. A look back there at some of the highlights in the health sector for 2019. We go straight into the big interest matters, St. Jude's Hospital. So much had been said on uh, what was found, how it was going to be dealt with, and then dealing with it. Now we are seeing uh, progress being made down at the site for St. Jude's Hospital. You are comforted that we are making strides in your own estimation? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it was a very difficult process, and one in which I think that we had to exercise the greatest amount of discipline. Um, in that given the amount of political pressure as well as public pressure would cause you maybe to do something that would not be to the benefit of the country in the long run. That was the tough part. 
and, and particularly when we met with the workers um, and the staff at, at the St. Jude's in the stadium. I mean, put yourself in these people's shoes that uh, on the fire, moved and did a miraculous job. We're expecting that maximum a year. It turned out to be then two years. Um, then it turned out to be five years. Then it turned out to be seven years. Um, and now they're on the verge of making it to nine, possibly 10 years. Um, on more than one occasion, they were told, prepare yourself to move and to be disappointed. Uh, so I would say to you, of all the people that we've met, their story was the most compelling. And I understand, and when we were having to meet with them to go through the process, that it wasn't as simple as looking at a building and saying, well, just fix up the building because it's better than the stadium. Yes, it would have been, but we would have spent a tremendous amount of money um, where we have already spent money, so it's money on top of money. And we would not have built a facility that would have been able to facilitate and support the development that's taking place in the South. That's the reality. And yes, would it be better than what it is? Anything would be better than the stadium. But it was the, uh, the strength, I think, that hopefully at some point people will look back and say, okay, my administration did do the right thing in what they did. So the problem was, first of all, we didn't expect to find the problem we had. You know, we were told that the hospital was going to open up in July of 2016. It's when uh, Minister Joseph and, and Minister Isaac went, they said, that's not happening. We then went and found that there was a letter that was written to the former Prime Minister in April of 2016 telling him it wasn't going to open in July and they needed another $60 million and possibly it would open at the end of 2016. So first of all, they already knew themselves they needed more money um, and that there was still going to be time required to be able to finish off the, the thing. I then sent an independent auditor, physical auditor, and the person came back and said, boy, Prime Minister, um, there's a lot of deficiencies in this, in this hospital. I mean, if you just walked into the emergency ward and compared it to OKEU, you could see automatically the difference. Uh, things like the MRI machine and x-ray machine were being put on the ground floor. They were told not to do that. The ceiling was too low. So what did they do? They dug it down. So you actually go down on a ramp to make it to where those facilities are going to be. Uh, the ramp to take you upstairs, too steep and too narrow. I, I, look, I can go on forever. But the point was is that uh, the amount of money that was going to require to be able to make that facility work became more and more difficult. And we went through the process of trying to say, okay, given the complexity of the situation, given the need to get into a better facility than the, than the stadium, can we put a temporary facility? And the amount of money that that was going to cost made no sense for us to be able to do that. So uh, eventually, once the decision was made that we would build a new facility, was to get the money, get the designs done, which we did. Um, we've gotten planning approval, and now work has begun. And we're trying to get into that facility before the end of this year, is what the goal is we have. But in some quarters, the thought, the thinking is that really and truly, your administration is just providing a sort of glorified polyclinic and not giving St. Lucian's a hospital. Uh, there's nothing further from the truth. Um, you know, it's a 90-bed facility. In fact, I'm going to go on record in here and say to you that I think that the facility that we're building at St. Jude's is even better than what was built at OKU. And I'm on record saying that, and I think that when the facility is done, people will be able to physically go and look at the two and make that decision. Now, why is that? When you look at the, the plan that we have for St. Lucia, we have said that in order to be able to double or triple the GDP, view for it has to come up. Can't have this, all this land and all this potential sitting there undeveloped. And so we're already starting to see it. So cruise ship facility coming in, new hotels coming in, industrial parks being expanded, new business parks coming in, uh, a secondary home market. So you need a proper hospital. Yes, for the Viewfortunes themselves, people from the South, people from my constituency, 
But also now, if you're going to be able to be successful and competitive on a global basis and create an international city, you need a hospital that meets that standard. Most importantly, the sort of re, um, rehabilitation, the expansion for Hironora International, because there are particular requirements for being able to have a healthcare facility within the vicinity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, I'm, look, I'm very encouraged by what we're doing. I'm very proud of what we're achieving. I think that once it's completed, um, the people will be very proud. But sadly, um, many people are missing the point with healthcare in thinking that the success of healthcare is the commissioning of OKEU and Victoria. They are important elements of it, but by themselves are not the solution to the healthcare problems and solution. And quickly, the OKEU, the update on that, uh, we talk about consultancy in terms of being able for, for management. Um, we know that there has been the sort of transfer of some of those services uh, in there. So where are we at with that, uh, with respect to how much closer are we to seeing the OKEU being commissioned? So again, I want to thank the Europeans for the gift in the first place. Um, but sadly, uh, the government was not ready. So you have a facility that's been finished for seven years. So we're having now to replace the air condition system because it, wasn't, it was never turned on. The MRI, MRI machine that never worked, never once did one patient, is now having to be replaced. Electrical systems, breakers, uh, ventilation systems, um, drainage systems, all having to be redone. Uh, so every day I'm being presented with another bill to operationalize OKEU. Uh, but we're not daunted. Um, we've come too far not to be able to complete this process. Uh, and what the problem was is that both for OKEU and St. Jude's, given the size that they are, and the cost of operating a hospital, okay, the cost of a running a bed at a hospital is about 500,000 US dollars a year. So you do not keep people in hospitals when it's unnecessary. So prepping people should be done in, in other facilities and post-operation and recovery needs to be done in other facilities. So they just really come in for the operational procedure at the main hospital and, and, and I don't mean get out but be removed somewhere else to a lesser costly facility. So that was the assumption and the ability to go from uh, Victoria of 170 beds to OKU of 120 beds I inherited that. Sadly, there was uh, assumptions. The assumptions were that you would fix up the primary health care facilities. So right now, it's no secret to St. Lucian's. If I fall sick or I have an emergency, am I going to go to the uh, hospital or am I going to one of my polyclinics first? I guarantee you, the vast majority, if not all St. Lucian's, are rushing to the hospital. The emergency center can't cope with the numbers of people and being people are being admitted into the hospital who don't need to be admitted into the hospital. So they're occupying now a very expensive bed. Yeah? And this, this, the system to be able to pay for all these services has been in, put in place. You really believe that any semi-intelligent person can't go to Victoria Hospital and start pointing out the deficiencies? Though they are very glaring, by the way. Glaring. So who, who in their right mind would want to have that? So the reason why it's that way is they don't have the money. That's the reality. So the state doesn't have the money either. The state doesn't have the money either. The state has been running deficits. Well, all we do is we have money to pay salaries. Because that's the one in which if you don't pay that, then all hell breaks loose. But if there isn't enough medicine, if there isn't enough sheets, if there isn't enough food, if a piece of equipment's not replaced, right, then people don't make as big of an issue about those things. But they hold you and your government accountable but when it's not available. But sadly, I mean, and, 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 and look, I say this because sadly people have become accustomed to that level of service. Not to say that they're happy with it, but we've become accustomed to it. There's an expectation of their right to be able to have access to health care and for the government to pay for it. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying to you that that's what I inherited. 
I, I inherited, we inherited a grossly inadequate system in which mediocrity was what the order of the day was. So opening up a hospital doesn't resolve that problem. The thousands of people in this country that don't have access to healthcare because they don't have the money are terrified to go to the doctor because if the doctor gives them a prescription, they can't get it anyway. People who are on high blood pressure pills and only take the pill when they get a headache, as if they was taking an aspirin. So I'm hearing you saying that for St. Lucians, perhaps you believe that we've not been able to reconcile what the reality is. And I think the world over, if, if people were to do some reading, do some research in countries around the world, healthcare remains one of the most expensive sectors for any government. It is, but... Or for it, any nation, because most governments don't get deeply involved in the healthcare sector. It, it is, but what I'm saying you, to you is that the, the vast majority of people in St. Lucia, or a lot of people in St. Lucia, believe that the most important part of what we're trying to do in healthcare is the operationalization of OKEU and St. Jude's. But I think that's not because the buildings are so dilapidated or they're non-existent. I, and and yeah. I hear you and we're fixing them. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the affordability of healthcare and putting a system in in which it's going to be able to maintain the standards in order to be, give people quality healthcare. And so the most important thing that my administration is doing is healthcare insurance. That's going to be the greatest gift. And speaking about that, again, I want to remind you that during your budget presentation, what you said was that legislative and institutional changes would be required to facilitate the full establishment of the national uh, health insurance scheme. So are we making headway where that is concerned? We're making great headway. I mean, and again, I want to thank the World Bank um, and their technical teams and PAHO and the Ministry of Health and NIC who've been working with us to get through this process. Mm -hmm. So basically what we're trying to do is introduce a healthcare insurance that will be managed by, through NIC, and which that once you have a job, that you're gonna be expected to make a contribution and your businesses make a contribution and it's gonna become compulsory. So today it's not. And so on average, a thousand to $1,200 a year is what people would have to pay to get um, healthcare insurance. We're saying if everybody participates, that number is going to come down significantly. So government will pay the premiums for the unemployed, the vulnerable, and the elderly. Right? Everybody else who's working will make a contribution along with the employers. Anybody who currently has insurance can keep their insurance um, or they can come and join our insurance. So a small business who have not been providing it will get the benefit of coming into an, a very affordable insurance program. Our insurance program will cover basic stuff. So it will cover um, private doctor visits. It will provide basic uh, operations. It will provide prescriptions, right? But what you can do is you can top up that insurance if you want to now be able to be covered for bigger operations or more um, in, intrusive um, uh, surgery. So that's a huge step in the right direction. Now, what's the biggest benefit of this? Is we now can start tackling healthcare in this country. We will know because everybody now will go to a doctor. So we don't have to guess what the state of health of our country is. We will know absolutely what the state of health. How many people have high blood pressure? How many people are, are pre-diabetic? How many people are advanced, et cetera, and everything else? It means that the Ministry of Health now can introduce preventive programs to address that. And because now we can continue getting uh, checkups from everybody else, we can see that we're making progress. So what do we know? That some of the most costly diseases we have here are non clinical diseases, mm -hmm. right? High blood pressure um, and diabetes. People, because they can't afford to go to the doctors, are waiting until they're almost at a critical point. They have to either be amputated or go in the dialysis machine. Or have reached the point of high blood pressure, they're going to have to go off work or they've almost borderline stroke or have had a stroke. So it means that the state now is getting them when they are in this critical position, it becomes a humanitarian cry. To give you an example, we've allocated $800,000 a year um, to be able to help people with their healthcare um, uh, cost. Mm -hmm. 
for two years in a row, we've broken five and a half million dollars. And their list of people wanting to get support still continues to come in. Okay? It's not doable. And we're doing it because we all have a conscience. We're, we're all uh, sensitive um, and have a tremendous amount of empathy with the people who are coming in who just don't have the money. How many families have lost their homes? How many people have had to cash in their pensions um, simply either to help themselves or to help a family member of which now they, they've gotten sick? So this is destroying our country. So this health care insurance is actually the most important thing because now it allows people to go and get um, treated. It also means that we're dealing with things beforehand. We can have programs to prevent it. Now here's an amazing thing. As you now improve the health of your nation, the cost of health care comes down. Why? Because less people are getting sick and therefore the insurance has to cover less. So we're now having to deal with cancer, dealing with car accidents, and then the, therefore your insurance premiums will be able to come down. So when we came in, none of this was in place. None of the primary um, facilities were ready. No money had been allocated. 10 million EC dollars is what was allocated to move into OKEU. And as I said, that they, they, they weren't even finished with St. Jude's. They'd already spent almost $130 million at St. Jude's, and it wasn't even close to be finished. Now again, unlike what people are saying, whatever demolitions have to take place, there were some little buildings that had to be demolished because they were grossly unsafe and inadequate. But in the existing building, the one that they built, what we're saying, let's make that into a university. If we can get a medical university in that location, we'll be the only island in the, country, in the region that has a medical university attached to a hospital. So for an internships and training purposes, that's a huge advantage. And we are in discussions with three companies looking at the possibility for them to be able to do that. I think that's going to be a huge win-win situation for all of us. Speaking about the strengthening of our primary healthcare sector, smart facilities, mm -hmm. great program with uh, funding from the UK government under the, its DFID uh, program. So 2017 uh, uh, health centers were being upgraded as part of that smart project. And I'll list them all in, in, in just a bit. Uh, the IMF, again, I want to go back and refer there because it gives a good um, indication as to where we're at. Um, the, that conclusion said that the government uh, gets credit for its commitment to resilience, but it underscored that um, considered efforts are really needed to mobilize climate financing. So we get points for being able to recognize that we have to do more for the healthcare infrastructure in making it more resilient, but again, the money aspect, being so, able to mobilize for that. So first of all, primary healthcare services and making them green uh, and the resilience part of it. So Deriso was a beneficiary of that. So mm -hmm. the, the goal here was that we put in a, a water tank, we put in a backup generator, we put in LED lights, we put in um, uh, cameras, so that if there was a hurricane, that they become self-sufficient for a period of time. Uh, versus in the old days, they, they didn't have that. If they became isolated, they were closed down and they were actually no use to people and medicine that was in there would not be refrigerated. So it's not every primary health care service is going to do that, but it's being spread all around the country in order to make sure that there's diversity in that. And I really want to thank Diffid and Paho um, for that level of assistance. But in addition to that, we're fixing up over 33 facilities and adding equipment to them in order that people now feel more comfortable going there first. So in order to take that stress off of the main hospitals and to allow them to be able to work, two things will happen. One is that, for instance, if you go to the hospital and you have an operation and you get a bandage, mm -hmm. you should be able to go back home and you don't have to go back to the hospital to be able to get the bandage changed. You can go now to your... Um, uh, the Lovana Center? Yes, or a polyclinic to be able to get that done. And that takes a tremendous, one, it's easier for them, but that's the level of, of skills that we want to have in our nurses. In addition to that, the educational program will be done through those centers as well. So, I mean, in my case in Deriso, because things kept breaking in, nobody wanted to stay there alone, right? So it just basically by putting the fencing up, putting the cameras around, 
and, and strengthening it, it helps significantly in that, in that regard. So I'm very excited about that. In terms of resilience, you're 100% right, it costs money. Um, what we've been arguing on a global basis, and I'm very proud that St. Lucia has been taking the lead, and I really want to thank Dr. Ribergert for the amount of traveling that she has done, um, the work that she's been doing behind the scenes in terms of really pushing this initiative, um, is how do we can get monies available to us to be able to build more resilience. And St. Lucia has made the decision in our roads, in our um, uh, facilities we're currently building, we're building that resilience in. Um, some of the other countries are in significantly more debt and don't have the capacity, so I'm fighting also for them. But there are some bigger issues. Let's take VG Beach as an example. Uh, when we did the modeling, and if the water level rises by three feet, that VG Beach actually will go right across the runway and connect to Ganters Bay, and VG will become an island. So how do you resolve that problem? So we, what we think is we have to do is bring a maritime coastal team in, look at the possibility of creating a fake reef further out, and reclaim some of the beach. So what will happen is when the heavy waves come, their fake reef helps cut the energy and helps stop now all the, the, the sand from coming apart, and it pushes now the problem further back out. Cul-de-sac. Cul-de-sac is going to flood if the water level rises. You can already see that the sea level and the river level are parallel to each other. So the question is, how do you resolve that problem? Do you drain the area? Do you create better drains? Do you create a reservoir so the fresh water comes down and you hold the reservoir and we then pump it out so it means you build a wall like a dam down at the bottom? Those are the things that we're having to look at, but once we've discovered what we're supposed to do, where's the money going to come from? And sadly, none of these things are going to improve the capacity of the country. What they do is help now prevent the country from damaging, or if we have a major hurricane, that the recovery isn't as bad as it would be if we had, didn't have those things in place. Um, and that's what the challenge that we have on a global basis. So debt to GDP, uh, access to OECD monies, how is that debt going to be treated? Um, and then how quickly can we get the money and also implement the projects? I mean, the DFID project that we have is money that was given by Prime Minister Cameron for the West Coast Road. And we, we were hoping to get it started in 2020. So it's taken almost eight years to be able to execute that program. You hear the complaint with CDB. I mean, CDB is a great agency, and they're only following the rules that they have. But it's not the swiftest agency, particularly when you're dealing with climate change. Why? Every year there's a new hurricane season. So time is against us. Um, and so this is why we're trying to push the envelope, do the advocacy that we're doing um, in terms of getting the world to change its mind. Or we're, the World Bank is helping us and maybe now creating a foundation. Um, the, we'll present a paper at the heads of government meeting in CARICOM in February. We're hoping then we can get it approved by the multilateral agencies at the spring meeting. And then we have this year the Commonwealth meeting, which is taking place in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. While we're there, because 34 SIDS, small island development states, are members of the Commonwealth, we're hoping that we can all sign on now to this foundation and that now this becomes a vehicle to allow development agencies and countries to be able to provide funds to be able to help the SIDS resolve this climate change problem. And as we go to break, let me just list what these smart facilities are right here in St. Lucia. We have the Comfort Base Citizen, uh, Senior Citizens Home, the Leclerc Wellness Center, the VFO Wellness Center, the Transit Home, uh, Deriso, uh, Bellevue and Monrepoix, Saltibus Morgouj, the Lafag Wellness Center, Bexon Library, and Richfall Wellness Center, Moshi Entrepo T. Roche, and the Castries wellness center so across the island there you could see a broad spectrum of what's happening to make us more resilient at least in the healthcare sector stay with us when we come on back we are discussing tourism the world's climate is changing and that affects all of us storms are becoming increasingly intense 
floods, periods of intense drought and heavy rain stress farm animals and destroy our crops. Higher average ocean temperatures kill our coral reefs and change the migratory patterns of fish. St. Lucia contributes only 0.0015% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is doing its part, along with countries around the world, to reduce the emissions that are warming our world and changing our climate. These efforts are called mitigation. But decades of emissions have already changed the climate, and the green gases in the atmosphere today will increase average global temperatures even more. We need to adapt, that is, do everything we can to prepare for and respond to the actual and expected negative effects of climate change. And everyone has a role to play. We need to protect our crops, build homes that withstand storms, and keep our drains and waterways free of garbage to help us recover or bounce back from climatic events. Learn more about the Government of St. Lucia's National Adaptation Plan and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your fellow St. Lucians. And welcome back to our discussion with Prime Minister the Honorable Alan Chastney. We're discussing the year in review 2019. Tourism, St. Lucia has had an unprecedented year of success in this highly competitive global industry. Uh, we experienced a 7% um, increase in um, f uh, arrivals uh, over 2018. And our stay over arrivals um, for 2019, something like in the region of 400,000. So again, unprecedented for us. So we'll take a look now at some of the highlights in that sector and we'll come back to expound on some of those points. Throughout 2019, St. Lucia's tourism industry experienced record highs in all areas from arrivals, stayover and cruise to airlift, product development and investment. An unprecedented 1.3 million visitors came to the island shores, 400,000 was the overs, representing a 7.1% increase over 2018, solidifying St. Lucia as one of the fastest growing tourist destinations in the Eastern Caribbean. Essential to the sector's growth is airlift. American Airlines in 2019 expanded services to St. Lucia, introducing a non-stop American Airlines flight from Chicago on December 21. Up until November 2019, American Airlines had provided 100,000 seats to destinations in Lucia, representing 43% of the seating capacity out of the United States. The cruise sector also recorded successes following the expansion of berthing facilities at Point Seraphine that enables the accommodation of Vista, Quantum and Freedom class vessels. On November 15, with a capacity of 1,800 passengers and over 750 crew, the MV Marella Explorer 2 made its inaugural call in Port Castries. The senior marketing manager at the St. Lucia Tourism Authority was among officials who welcomed the vessel. Efforts at improving the island's tourism product and heightening the visitor experience continued in 2019. You would have seen uh, the renovation of the market preparatory stage, which has already commenced. Um, you would have seen the relocation of the vendors. Uh, we would have trained about 200 vendors to be part of this new uh, initiative that we're doing to ensure that we can um, advance uh, greater economic penetration in the sector. Meantime, the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project is undertaking the pedestrianization of the William Peter Boulevard, a facade improvement program for existing small businesses, and the upgrading of sidewalks. The St. Lucia Summer Festival sizzled as the 2019 Jazz Festival returned to form. A collaboration with the Lincoln Center of New York featured prolific jazz musicians from the home front, the region, and international. On the hills of the St. Lucia Jazz Festival, St. Lucia Carnival came to life in July, attracting increased participation from St. Lucians and visitors. In fact, there was a 13% increase in tourist arrivals for the month over July 2018. Paradise. 
St. Lucia's demand in the tourism market was underpinned with the prestigious title of world's leading honeymoon destination for a record 11th time. The announcement was made on November 28th at the 26th annual gala ceremony of the World Travel Awards in Oman. The winning streak continued with the Minister for Tourism being named Caribbean Tourism Minister of the Year by the Caribbean Travel Awards. Honorable Dominic Fede was described as having stewarded a destination that is one of the hottest in the Caribbean and has become a haven for high-profile investment. Glittering Sands Beach Park, located at Toulouse, on October 15 became the newest addition to the tourism product. Owned and operated by St. Lucians, the facility employs more than 20 persons from the constituency of Ancillary Canaries. The beach park welcomed the first group of over 50 cruise ship guests for a fantastic day in paradise. St. Lucia's talents were showcased at Cari Festa 14, held in Trinidad and Tobago. The offering was a mix of theater, music, literary arts, performance poetry, traditional performances, visual arts, craft, and fashion. The performances included a showcase of Our La Wars Festival and a theatrical performance of A Little Folk Tale, written by Monique Ogis and Jesse Myers and directed by artistic director Junior Frederick. The world celebrated along the island as it commemorated 40 years of independence. His Royal Highness Prince Charles made an official visit to St. Lucia. A special ceremony was held in Viewfort in his honor. Above all, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me particular pride that St. Lucia today is such a vital member of our Commonwealth family, which binds together 2.4 billion of us across 53 countries on six continents through our shared experience and common values. And the physical embodiment of our talent and creativity now stands at the Castries waterfront. Master sculptor Jalim Yudovic produced a statue that captures the essence of being St. Lucian. This is your sculpture, St. Lucia. From Grosile to Babuino, from Castries to Denry, from Miku to Viewfort, from Larry to Chozel, from Sufra to Canaries, from Ancillary back to Castries. This sculpture is symbolic of how far we've come and where we want to go. A look there at some of the highlights of 2019 in this area of tourism, and we did include culture in there because the two are certainly intermixed. Now, for the government, your aim is to increase GDP contributions to a staggering $1.9 billion by 2022. The hope also is to attract investments of $3.5 billion, also by 2022, and to create over 4,000 jobs in the tourism sector. Some people may say a bit ambitious. Um, look, we've developed a master plan for tourism, which includes a branding position as well as um, a strategic plan in how to diversify the tourism, the tourism product. Uh, we're not only looking at larger hotels and uh, higher end hotels, but also very excited about our village tourism um, program to be able to help mm -hmm. St. Lucians to be able to get more involved in the market. You know, the uh, um, Sandy Beach project, uh, Ansa Sab, uh, is probably one of my favorite projects ever. You know, it's funny because uh, when Sir John was alive, um, and before anything had been built on the uh, causeway um, at Pigeon Island, the concept that we're using there is what we want, I, I wanted him to use on Pigeon Island, which basically would be to not allow development on the beach, um, but have like some kind of boardwalk that would separate the hotels from the beach and then create a village. And so subdivide it and allow smaller properties to be able to prosper and to create m something that's much more culturally relevant to what your destination is. People are looking for more authentic vacations. Clearly there are people who like to go to all-inclusives and bigger all-inclusives and there are people who like the uniqueness of a Jade Mountain or a Sugar Beach. But there are more and more people who want to go to intimate inns 
and go to places where they don't get to see what they get back home. And so it's how do you create an environment to nurture that culture of yours. And, and uh, Sandy Beach is exactly that. So the, a new road will be built along the fence of the airport um, going into the Viewfort town where Bank of Nova Scotia is. Uh, the land between the concrete road and going back to the, 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 the city of Viewfort will be subdivided. Um, water, sewage, electricity being put in, a building ordinance will be put in, special incentives. And so it means a solution now can buy 10,000 square feet of land. Uh, water, electricity, and sewage is already there. You don't have to borrow the money for all of that. Have special incentives. And then now there's a development around them. And that is much easier for them to be able to sell. Uh, with the cruise ship port coming into Viewfort uh, for home porting, pre and post stays. It means that people could now go and stay in Sandy Beach. The goal is to have in excess of a thousand rooms in that location. We also know that there's development of smaller properties around the island. So we're creating a new entity called Village Tourism Incorporated. Yeah, which of course, Ansler and Grozy and Sufre are the lead uh, communities or the villages uh, right now, so. So well, Village Tourism Incorporated and Village Tourism are, are part of a, of a same circle, but they're not exactly the same projects. So the projects in Ancelaray, Groselay, and Soufrere about building the physical infrastructure to support it. So if I want to have a small guest house now in Soufrere, downtown Soufrere, Soufrere, it's become more feasible. I can go to the Hummingbird Beach to go for the day to the beach. The square is there, and we're now redeveloping the waterfront, and it's now in a very attractive town. The goal is now to build up on the restaurants and create a water taxi service. So people from Anshastney or from Sugar Beach now can take a water taxi and come into town and walk around town and go to these small restaurants in that particular area. It's to do the same thing in Ansler Ray. Right? I, I think it would be very difficult for a small guest house to survive in ancillary mm -hmm. with the same with the current uh, standards that you would see there. Groselay has done a better job, but there's still improvements that have to be done in the Groselay town, i.e. the beach facilities, the drains, um, uh, clearing up in proper ordinances, building back up the older buildings so that the, it continues the character of, of, of the village. So physically, there will be village tourism, but the company we're creating is called Village Tourism Incorporated. So what happens is if I want to be able to get into the tourism business, let's say I worked at the hotel as a front desk manager, or I was a reservations manager, or a food and beverage manager, I want to open up a restaurant. I go in, I, I, I'm tested by the group in terms of what are my deficiencies are. And if you're opening up a small guest house, we will give you the accounting system. We will give you the booking system. Um, we will give you the marketing tools. We will provide the training for your line staff and for your middle management on a regular basis. We'll give you advice on your interior decorating. Um, we will now help you source your towels and your sheets and your soaps. And so it's starting to create a minimum standard. So there are Europeans and other people who want to come to St. Lucia for two or three weeks and stay at different properties. So that those properties have to be relatively same in terms of standard. I mean, Switzerland and Austria have been doing this for years, France. This is one of the oldest types of tourism, and it's my favorite type of tourism um, ever, is village tourism. That's why my family, when I had a choice of building a hotel, I built it in Rodney Bay, not on the beach. I built it off the beach, because that's the confidence I have in that kind of product. But unfortunately, Rodney Bay is still not of standard to make village Pretty tourism be able to, to work. And this is what we want to be able to do. It, to be successful and sustainable, your local population must be involved, must be benefiting. And then when you bring it to a scale, the likelihood of a smaller restaurant and a smaller restaurant buying food from the farmers and buying products from all the other suppliers is much greater than when you're a bigger hotel, you have economies of scale, and therefore you can bring it in from abroad much easier. So the goal is really to make sure that we have a balance in what we're doing from a tourism perspective and building up the rooms um, and making the economic impact we think is necessary. So part of the, part of the uh, plan for product development has to do with castries, the beautification mm. of castries. Included in that is the rehabilitation of the castries market. So that plan, uh, people are looking forward to a timeline. 
because we've seen bumper to bumper uh, traffic now with the cruise uh, passengers um, coming in. So where are we at with timelines regarding that? So um, the redevelopment of the Caspi's market, the plan has already been completed, and I really want to call, uh, congratulate Mr. Poyot. I mean, he is really a, a gem in this country in terms of, you know, he did the Derek Walcott um, home, he did the, um, the square in Sioux Frere, many buildings around St. Lucia you know, it was his inspiration. Um, and, and really, he's, a, for me, a cultural icon and a person I have a tremendous amount of respect for. So the plan has already been done. We've started with the place where the vendors go in the back. So a new roof, um, new resurfacing. They're now about to do the bathrooms. They're putting in now next to where the, the marketing board is to put in a container, a container park for s selective smaller shops. Then we will start developing the interior of the building, including the old building itself. So the goal here is to create an atmosphere um, that small restaurants can thrive, that vendors now start becoming franchisees. So what I want to see is I want to see the vendors become franchisees to the, the uh, arts and craft segment here. So people who are producing pots, people who are producing baskets, um, these young people in terms of costumes and uh, natural soap products. So the idea is that they would help the vendor design their stall, help them design their uniform, teach them how to sell their product, and also provide them with a price spectrum. So now you're not going to see that every vendor is selling the exact same thing uh, and that they're going to be able to add value. And so a tourist walking around is going to be able to smell, see and hear and taste St. Lucia. You know, uh, my vendors who are on um, Jeremy Street right now, nobody's got a blender and mixing fresh juices. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that we need to start seeing, and that's what's going to happen at the Castries market. And that you're going to have a variety of standards, so basic products all the way to arts and, and paintings in the area. Small restaurants, so a tourist going in can get the flavors of St. Lucia. Me, looking for a restaurant to eat in St. Lucia, I can go there. It's almost like being in a bazaar. Um, so when we went to Burroughs Market in London, this is what we're really sampling behind. And I have to tell you, ecstatic about what we're going to be doing there. Followed by the demolishing of the printery. Um, I'd like to think the parliament, but the parliament will probably be on hold for temporarily. And then the courthouse. But the ultimate goal is Constitution Park will be a park. So when I'm standing at the Castries Market and I look back, I'm going to see the cathedral, which now is going to connect us to the uh, um, Derek Walcott Square. Now, again, Which is uh, also getting a facelift. Yes. How can you have a person and name a park after Derek and it looks the way it does? A cultural icon of this country, both in um, all forms of the arts. Where, 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 where do I see that in that place? And normally when you have iconic parks, you will see restaurants and activity around it. Where is it? A car park around it. So the goal is to really change that. Um, the customs building, sheds four and five, start clearing out the place so that now that those become pedestrianers and you allow now the city to be able to breathe. Moving the container port now to cul-de-sac. Um, getting, we want to be able to put a convention center in, and now newer, older buildings in the location. CDCs, we're looking to demolish those buildings, but we want to make sure that we have a place to relocate people before we do that. That will become now the new government center. Um, so you'll have your high court, you have your prime minister's office, you have um, parliament, um, you have now certain government buildings that are going to be in that location. And so there's this character, and I want to be able to walk through Castries. We're talking about Banans. I love Banans. You know, nobody's talking about removing the people from Banans, but we're talking about improving the quality of the facilities, getting the dock going back again. And you talked about congestion. So why not have it from Point Seraphin? We have a little ferry that carries the passengers that want to go on tour to the south, take them to the Banans. All the buses are waiting for them there. Now you don't have all those buses going through what I call the gauntlet. Move the taxis that are currently by Place Carinage, still have them on the inside, but they go and collect their bus down by sheds four and five. So when they're leaving, they're leaving in front of this last but building. So again, you're not congesting the town. So these are all obvious decisions 
But for some reason, everybody's scared to pull the trigger on these things. And that's what I'm very excited about. We've spent the year redoing the plans because when I made the pronouncements, everybody said, oh, there was no consultation. But I think people forgot the fact that there was an intensive consultation in 2000 and 2000, 2007 and 2008. But guess what? Went back to the process, met with everybody again, and pretty much the same plans. But do you rather. think that not pulling the trigger really has to do with the cost that is attached to all what you have described there? It sounds all wonderful, it's great, but how do we pay for it? So we um, have cut a deal with the cruise industry um, to allow them to manage both our Castries port and our Viewfort port. That's the MOU that we signed with Royal Caribbean and Carnival. They're in fact bringing down with them uh, a company to, to review our plans, um, finesse them in whatever way that they think it's going to be possible. So we've borrowed um, 13 million US dollars to do the redevelopment of the Castries market, um, which is part of the loan agreement that we have with the Taiwanese government. Uh, we are um, uh, spending our own money to demolish the existing buildings and to put in the proper parks. Uh, and then when the cruise industry comes in, they're prepared to also bring cash to the, to the table. Um, so they've agreed to look at their tax structure, and we've looked at our tax structure um, in terms of, of having a tax on that will help now pay for these, di these different developments that we're going to do. It. We're meeting with the EU um, and also CDB about the infrastructure that's required in castries, sewage. We know that water is leaking. Um, putting in better utilities, how we're going to deal with the surface waters, how we're going to expand some of the roads and create now the whole new traffic network. So again, by accessing development funds to be able to do that. So it's still going to cost us money, but at least it's on a more concessional basis. We believe the return comes in by bringing more business to town. 4.30, Castries is dead. Okay? We have a private sector investment that's going to go into Point Seraph and we're going to build Merritt Courtyard. We're hoping to begin and break ground, break ground very soon. We've got a plan for redeveloping the shops. They're horrible. And, and the fact is, is that you can't have a facility on prime land like that that's only there for the cruise industry. I want to see Point Seraphim being used seven days a week, all the time. By so locals and visitors by everybody. alike. You know, as well as the tourism industry is doing and the plans that you've just um, outlined there uh, sound really good and then asked about how are we paying for it. You spoke about looking at the tax regime and so forth. The hotel accommodation tax or fee, if you want to use, if that's a more dumbed down word. Uh, it has been announced that it's been introduced and it's not something off the cuff. We've heard about it being in the, in the pipeline for a while now. But there is that public concern that really and truly you're sort of overburdening the one sector that is keeping St. Lucia afloat. So sadly, I could have rewritten the article. St. Lucia is the first country in the Caribbean to reduce the VAT rate on tourism. But then you're saying that you take it away, but you also... Right. Undercutting. So, so. so the point, that's what I'm saying to you, that's why I said to you I could rewrite the story and say to you that St. Lucia is reducing the VAT rate on tourism from 10% to 7%. And then applying a fee. Correct. So it's, a, it's what we call a revenue neutral tax. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of doing what we're doing is in order to allow the monies to be collected directly off of the, of the, the, the uh, tourist. And it's a user fee of St. Lucia. Right, so they're paying, if they're staying at a smaller property, $3 per person per night. If they're staying at a larger property, $6 per person per night. Okay? That money is going directly into the tourism authority. So that means that the tourism authority is no longer dependent on the tourism budget. So the 35 or $40 million a year that we're putting into the tourism authority, that stops. By being now a separate entity like SLASPA, because that's how SLASPA makes its money, off of taxes and revenues that it's generating at the port, both at the airport and at the seaport, it means it has its own budget, has its own board, because there's too many restrictions to it when it's operating within the government context. I mean, you remember me when I was director of tourism, Absolutely. when I was minister of tourism, constantly complaining um, that the cash flow of money 
all of a sudden when you're doing well is when government cuts back on the revenue and that you fight in cabinet every day because people see this as money that could go to healthcare or education or infrastructure, which all need. But the fact is, is that investing in, mar doing marketing is an investment. A brand is a value. So the better known your brand is, the better it helps bananas, the better it helps our rums, better it helps you when you travel and that people know where St. Lucia is. Okay, there is a, that's an asset value to the state that we continue to be able to invest in. And that's why we say the solutions. You know, when we're committing crime or we do things against the tourists, what we're doing is we're undermining our own brand. Because those are the stories that are going to be remembered out there. So I don't want people to think that they should do it for tourism. Do it for yourself. Do it for Brand St. Lucia. Let's be known as one of the best places to live, the best places to invest. That's the story that we want outside there. So the changes that we've made are to facilitate um, making that happen. And so therefore, there will be no increase in the cost of coming to St. Lucia, but structurally now, we've made it much more efficient in order for the monies to go into the Tourism Authority and for the Tourism Authority now to be able to spend the money. The deal that I did with the crews, with the hoteliers is very simple. There were deficiencies in the old St. Lucia Tourist Board. Too much money was being spent on overheads. Too much money was being spent on events, okay? Which they weren't understanding what the value to the branding was. So, so we've we, restructured that. We've taken events out. We've put some restrictions in how much money can be spent on an administrative basis and to make sure that there is greater efficiency and more accountability in building our brand. But now, people are concerned that what's happening to the tourism industry is that now St. Lucia becomes a more expensive destination. So I just said that's not the case. So if you reduce the VAT rate, but you put it back on as a form of a head tax, you're revenue neutral. So that's what I was saying, is that the cost of coming to St. Lucia hasn't been has changed. Has not been affected Would not at be all. affected at all. Pending projects. Mm -hmm. In the tourism industry, you did speak about the Sandy Beach uh, project. Uh, during the budget, you did indicate that we would be having um, no more, less than five or so projects. So where are we at with that? Are we still so, uh, on stream? Cabot, which is a new golf course, hotel, and real estate project is broken ground. So they're doing 90 rooms in an 18-hole golf course and 300 real estate lots. Um, I'm extremely saddened over the Sandals project, to be honest with you. You know, that's a project that um, should have started and actually would have been coming to completion right now. It would have added almost 400 new suites to St. Lucia on a piece of land that is only earmarked for tourism development. It's the piece of land that lies between Sandals Grand and the landings. Um, sadly, the landings um, decided to challenge um, the DCA in their decision. They lost the, the first case um, and they've decided um, to appeal. Uh, and the developer basically is holding off because he feels it's too large of an investment to take that risk. Um, it was a very difficult position for me because I really want to let all my investors in my country know that this is a good place to invest and we follow the rule of law. So that would have, that's a significant delay um, and we would have already been feeling the economic benefit and the momentum from that happening. But I'm still hoping that that project is going to happen. Is that the only stalled project? Um, because you did mention that the Hilton yep, so would have been what, doing that shock. So, so what happened, well not Hilton, we had Hilton going in at Rex mm -hmm. and we were, plans were completed, everything Hyatt. ready to go. Uh, Hilton first, which was at Rex. Um, and we were very advanced and then the Rex people decided to do a partnership with Sunwing with the same mm -hmm. people who are doing the Royalton, not only on the San Lucia project, but on all of their developments around the, island, uh, the country. So Grenada, Tobago, and Antigua in particular. So it means they had to go back to the drawing board. Um, my understanding is they're pretty far advanced in their concepts. They're looking at, uh, I think it's a Planet Hollywood to go where the building was demolished because they had gone as far as to demolish the building. Uh, they're rebranding the old Royal St. Lucian into Mystique, or Mystique, I think, Mystique. Um, and then they're also going to be developing a new branded property where Papillon is. Uh, so that is supposed to be starting later this year. We then have the Hyatt project, which is going to go in shock. So there's an 800-room property 
400 rooms all-inclusive, 400 rooms EP, with also major conference facilities. Um, you have the Marriott Courtyard that's coming here at Point Seraphine. Uh, you have the uh, Sabusha project, which now is going to be a Park Hyatt. So originally that was going to be a Fairmont, and there was new owners that came in um, and have taken over that property. So we're hoping that that's going to get started very soon. The uh, people at DSH are developing um, their first hotel, which will be right next to the site. What's exciting is that hotel is also going to be a university um, with Lausanne University, which is phenomenal. I mean, you're talking about the best um, uh, hospitality university in the world. And solutions will be given access to that university on a very affordable um, basis. But once you become a graduate of Lausanne, you can get a job yeah, anywhere, anywhere, anywhere in, in, the the, in the world. We have like 30 seconds left. You have Canals, which is yes, the Honeymoon is Beach. This which weekend? Is, this Come weekend, uh, January 15th, yeah. we're breaking ground. Uh, so, look, very exciting times. Uh, and there are other things, but I want to wait until they're more advanced before we announce them. All right. We've now concluded our second hour with Prime Minister the Honorable Alan Chastney as we look back at some of the events of 2019. In our final hour, we'll be discussing infrastructure as well as citizen safety, very key areas for us here. Stay with us as we come back with our third hour. I'm Melissa Joseph, see you on the other side.